Hi, I'm Peter Claussen from Bugs in Cyberspace. In this video, you're going to have the opportunity to win one of these three stickers. All you have to do is ask a question in the comments section down below. This video is about questions and answers, mostly about bugs. The questions don't have to be about bugs. I'm answering questions that people asked of me yesterday on Instagram. And we have two winners to announce. These are for two Instagram people, these cool weevil stickers from Shapes in Nature. And those winners are Sourdough Made in Heaven for asking a question about the podcast that I do with my friend Jesse over at the Shapes in Nature YouTube channel. And then by Tyler6, T-Y-L-3, R6 is how he wrote his username on Instagram, who asked a question about uh, talking your parents into allowing you to keep roaches. So you guys are the two winners. Let me know which of the Weevil stickers you want. And then all of you here on YouTube, please in the comments area down below, ask a question, which I will answer in a follow-up video. And for your chance, we'll have three winners to win one of these three prizes. We have questions later in this video you're watching about scorpions, about rhino roaches, and stick insects are also sort of featured as I answer the questions in the remainder of this video. So again, YouTubers who are watching this video now, ask a question down below and I'll use a random comment picker to pick a winner. Thank you for watching. So in today's video, I'm going to be answering questions that were asked of me in the Instagram story area. There's this 24 hour section on Instagram and a little question and answer game you can play. And people there ask me questions and I'll be answering those questions here today. They're generally about bug related thing, but I've been on Instagram for quite a few years and some of them know me a little better than others and that I sometimes like to give advice on other topics. I always like to say there as I'm playing the Q&A game with them where I introduce it, I say something along the lines of if this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911 for entertainment purposes only. And the reason for that is because people sometimes get upset that I don't answer the questions the way they want me to. And I just do it for fun because I enjoy it. I have been answering people's questions now through my website for 24 years. And that's a very long time to be asked the same questions over and over again. You will drive yourself insane if you don't find some way to have fun doing that. And it's exactly what I do. It's just have fun with it. So I'm just going to read them in order, the order in which they came in. Uh, I haven't uh, rehearsed my answers to these questions. I'm going to literally blitz through this here on my old phone, which I'm not I might struggle to work with here a little bit. Um, but let's just start at the beginning here. I'm not going to skip any questions. Some of them I may not answer. Some of them may be inappropriate, and so I won't answer them for that reason, and I'll probably try not to read those ones as well. Let's get going here. Uh, somebody asked, and I won't say the people's names either because these questions really are asked anonymously, and so even though I can see their names, I'm not going to say their names in case they didn't want to uh, have that information made public. Somebody asked, most frightening experience with an arthropod, perhaps a rock flipping jump scare. While we are out flipping rocks in Arizona, for example, looking for bugs, we do often encounter, and that's why we're flipping the rocks in the first place, a variety of scorpions and centipedes and things like that. I don't recall ever having a scare from something, a rock that I flipped over. However, you're always sort of on edge about such things, and uh, that's a good survival instinct to have. When you flip a rock, you grab it from the opposite side and you flip it so that if there is a snake under there, for example, um, that it will go away from you 
and particularly if it strikes, it will strike away from you instead of towards you. And so as you're flipping that rock over, the rock is itself sort of a shield against the snake or the scorpion if it happens to be under there. Best to wear gloves, of course, when you're flipping rocks, you'll see black widows and things under there. <clears throat> and though a black widow isn't likely to bite you, and certainly won't chase you down if you were to reach over the edge of a rock with your bare hands and to pinch a black widow there between your finger and the rock. It could then choose to bite you just out of defense for itself. We have at times in uh, tromping around through the desert looking for bugs encountered quite a few different kinds of snakes including many rattlesnakes, sidewinders, and things like that. They blend in really well and so you always have to keep an eye out for those sorts of things, and particularly at dusk and uh, after dark, which is when we happen to be out looking for the night bugs, of course. And so just keep your eyes open. Um, other than that, not too much uh, out there. I did one time, um, oh, where'd the question go? Uh, I did one time swing a machete uh, I was cleaning out the backyard uh, at one of my dad's rental properties, lots of overgrown weeds, and I swung very near to a paper wasp nest, and a big swarm of bees sort of chased me out of that area. I don't recall that I was stung, but uh, it was a pretty close call. Uh, the next person asked, when are you coming to see me? <laughs> and of course, um, the, the world is shut down, and so I'm not traveling at all. Are there any facts, things about any specific insect species that stick out to you? Also, stick bug pun. pun. Are there things that uh, stick out to me? Uh, I'll, I'll make a, an answer about stick bugs uh, in that case, I guess. A fact about stick bugs being that the largest insect egg in the world comes from Heteropteryx dilatata, the jungle nymph. And uh, a long time ago, I raised jungle nymphs. They are about this long. That's not counting their legs, that's just their body length. The width of their bodies is larger than my thumb. Some people call them leaf insects, even though they're a little bit more stick-like as compared to the other leaf insects in the genus Philium. But they are very big bugs. They produce very big eggs. Those eggs take about a year to hatch. And so while you're incubating them, which incubation in this case just means keeping them in a bed of slightly moist uh, substrate like vermiculite or coconut fiber mixed with sand often, um, you're not, never really sure whether they're going to hatch, and so you're left wondering for that year, what's going to happen? Are they going to hatch? Did they die? Did they dry out too much? And so it's a long wait. Uh, you have to be very dedicated to them. I hear animals running around on my roof, I think. Squirrels. What is your favorite invertebrate to breed? A lot of these questions I will have to answer not on the basis of what I enjoy for myself. I run a business and so I don't do a lot of things. There's just so much going on all the time that I, I enjoy my work, I enjoy my business. And so uh, by that measure, I would say that I enjoy breeding the orchid mantises the most because I'm going to be working on something. And among all of the many things that I keep, those are one of the most popularly requested things. And so um, in service to my customers, I enjoy making those available as regularly as possible. And not just because they're <laughs> very lucrative. Someone says, can you ask me a question? <laughs> um, yeah, I can. My question is, can you ask me a question? Another question, what can I do to help with insect conservation? Um, I like to make the following answer to that whenever anybody asks me, and particularly right now because of uh, the timing of the question. The best thing that you can do for insect conservation if you are a citizen of the United States is to vote. November 6th, vote. Uh, someone asked, what's a question? Creative. 
Next question, what is your biggest reason you love bugs and what are some tips to spread that love? Um, I've never been on this crusade to spread the love about insects. I'm watching a fly fly past right now. It just comes very natural to me. It's what I enjoy. Uh, I've always been a fan of nature and ever since I could first go outside, I just wanted to see what was happening out there. We close ourselves off in these houses all day and uh, for most of our lives or buildings in the workplace. And we, we're all just waiting to get out. Um, when it's winter, we can't wait for it to be summer again so we can go outside and uh, feel the warmth and enjoy the fresh air and to see life sort of renewing itself in that way it does in the springtime. And then the change of seasons like we're experiencing here in the fall right now. So for me, it's, it's never even just been about the bugs. It's just, it's, it's more of an internal thing. Um, it's wanting to escape that, that world inside and to come back outside. Um, bugs, of course, they move. And so when I'm out here, you know, there's leaves blowing in the wind a little bit, um, clouds moving across the sky, uh, not a whole lot happening besides that. It feels good to be out here regardless of anything. You see a bird land every once in a while, uh, but you can't get too close to it. Bugs for me, it, they're very gratifying. They come and something changes in my environment out here. It lands and then it flies off and there's something else. If I look around a little bit, I can generally find them. Over here to my right, I can see three orb weaver spiders in this tree right next to me. I don't know if it appears in the camera frame or not, but um, if I sit here and watch long enough, some, something will fly past and it will be caught in one of those three spider's webs. There's things happening out here. And uh, I see a little gnat flying down there behind the camera right now. No, it's a fly. It's, uh, it's in the family Muscadi and it's an orange fly. That's what they call them on Bug Guide because they have not been categorized outside of other kinds of house flies. Uh, the ones that we're all more familiar with, Musca domestica. Anyway, um, it's just constant gratification to be outside, to be away from the human world and all of the problems that come with it, just to sit out here and to make observations about simple things in life. You know, it's, it's just, it's a pure experience. It has nothing to do really with what you remember, even though I know the name of the fly and everything. I've put it in a category, but I still know almost nothing about it. I'm watching it. It's flying rather slowly down here behind the camera right now. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll flip the camera around to see if we can get a look at it as that plane goes by above. Um, well, it just flew up into the trees, probably saw me coming. And I'm going to put the camera back down here. It's probably not going to be in the same place it was. Anyway, um, and as far as spreading that love, I mean, it has to be your goal in life to figure out what you're passionate about, what gives you peace and comfort and happiness, uh, what you're curious about in this huge world of options around you. Um, most people, if they take the time, can connect with nature and something in nature on some level. For some people it's hunting, for some people it's fishing, for some people it's gardening, um, for some people it's hiking, for some people it's photography. Uh, just, you know, figure out, figure out what works for you and focus on what works for you. Um, some of you are watching this video today because uh, you like to see the world through my eyes and you, you know, it's, it's like my dad plays the piano. It's so amazing to watch him play the piano because he completely gets himself immersed in it when he's playing the piano. And it's an awesome thing to watch when someone's passionate about something. So figure out what works for you and you just do what you do and the love will spread just by virtue of that. I've got a lot of people watching me on Instagram and on YouTube and coming to my website and I'm just doing what I love and you guys make that possible uh, because we share an interest and um, 
that's 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 what's really cool is that you don't even really have to try you just have to be who you are and other people will see that and if they share your interests they'll just show up so uh, that was a longer answer let's see where where are we um have to go back one page here sorry i usually use the phone that i'm filming this with uh What's on your 2020 bingo card? <laughs> um, I guess that probably means what are my goals uh, for the year remaining? And uh, I mean, I'm borderline paranoid about uh, catching coronavirus. You never know. I mean, so many people have died, uh, over 200,000 here in the United States now. and. Um, you just, you, you never know whether you're going to be one of the unlucky people to catch it and then really, really suffer from it. Even if you catch it, you can pass it on. I live with my daughter. I could pass it on to her. I could pass it on to Jessica, who works for me, who has a boyfriend, who has some immune system issues. Um, I'm just going to be careful for the rest of the year. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to hunker down. I'm going to be working on my YouTube channel. I'm going to be running my business. And uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to wait. Uh, we sacrificed a lot of uh, time with friends this year. Uh, we all did. Uh, we all of our lives have been changed by this and so uh, my my most basic uh, bingo goal right now is to stay healthy and stay alive and I've made some changes too in my diet um, you know to make sure that my immune system is boosted right now um, and I'm, I'm feeling really good in terms of my health and my uh, physical and mental well-being it's a tough time for a lot of people but uh, I'm focusing all of my time and energy into my business, which happens to be pretty much what I do all the time anyway, so I'm not necessarily struggling as much as most other people. Someone asks, any recent millipede species you look forward to selling? Uh, I've mentioned a few times the uh, two species of pill millipedes. I had some babies recently. I need to check on the babies again. I had put the babies, I think, in an Instagram video, if not a YouTube video. I think just on Instagram. And uh, I should check in on them and see how they're doing. I also have some flame leg millipedes that are getting up to a good size and hopefully will be breeding in the next several months. And then uh, Thai rainbows. I have some babies of those. I've just been kind of waiting for summer to end before I list them up on the website because millipedes aren't great summer shippers and it's not really good business to be shipping sensitive uh, weather sensitive things out during the heat of summer you're almost asking for trouble and um, it's sort of like money in the bank I just keep them in the container they grow a little bit, a little bit larger and a little bit more stable and then fall comes and it's uh, suitable weather for shipping them safely next question what is the worst bite or sting or pinch you have had from an arthropod? And do any drugs come from bugs? I don't know if any drugs come from bugs. I imagine there's lots of things that do. Spanish fly comes to mind. You guys can Google that if you want to. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on lots of things. I have uh, sold insects to Harvard Medical, for example, where they, uh, they apparently study the gut fauna and the bacteria on the insect specimens that I send them, both captive bred ones and wild caught ones, even from here in my yard. And they told me what they were doing for that was uh, trying to find new antibiotics that they could in turn give to people who were sick. So always something fascinating going on with that. And as far as uh, the worst bite, sting, or pinch I've ever had, uh, bee stings. Uh, I'm not seriously sensitive or allergic to them. I don't carry an EpiPen or anything like that, but um, I do swell up quite a bit. So that's the answer to that. Uh, what beetle adaptation do you find the most interesting? <laughs> There's ground squirrels running up and down the tree over there. 
Uh, flight. Uh, the, the power of flight is probably the coolest adaptation ever. I mean, it's, it's nice to have this human thinking brain, although it seems to work against a lot of people. But um, being able to fly, I mean, we as humans cannot do that. Most humans cannot. And so that would be something that uh, I would personally like to do if I could uh, absorb and uh, uh, have any other insects ability. Do you, did you know one in four animals on Earth is a beetle? So 25% of animals on Earth is a beetle. So my question to that person back, uh, because they may be operating on old information, is did you know that uh, wasps, including parasitic wasps, are now thought to outnumber beetles in terms of species? Pretty interesting. And somebody said enjoying the podcasts with you and Jesse from at shapes and nature what can we expect in the future I appreciate you bringing this one up I am doing a weekly podcast with Jesse Green who runs the business shapes and nature last week we did an interview with somebody about wolves which I really enjoyed it's been very nice for me being a nature lover um, I've been focusing on insects for the majority of my life, but when I was young, I had Ranger Rick magazines and National Geographic, and I watched Nova and uh, uh, all sorts, any nature show that was on. I mean, back then we only had like 12 channels on the television, and so I was constantly watching public broadcasting, um, any, any Jacques Cousteau, anything that was on, uh, Mutual of Omaha. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, the podcast that we're doing is sort of getting me involved and in talking to people about other things. Our next show is going to be on sharks. We're going to be talking to somebody who's a shark expert. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, asking that person questions and just having the opportunity to learn about them myself. We had a mantis person on and we had a dragonfly person on. You can check out on YouTube the Shapes in Nature channel where Jesse and I are just starting to upload some of these podcasts that we've recently begun doing. Thank you for the question. Uh, next set of questions here. What is the best way to get your parents to allow you to keep pet roaches? <laughs> uh, I really enjoy these kinds of questions. And uh, as a parent, my, uh, my youngest is 19, by the way, I always encourage children who ask these questions to listen to their parents. Very important. Um, while you are young, uh, your, your, your life is just going to be made so much easier. You're going to ask your parents for things all day, every day. And so the more you ask for, the more comfortable they are in telling you no. Uh, another way I like to answer this question is uh, clean your room. <laughs> Try cleaning your room before you, you make this ask. Um, if you want to manipulate them a little bit, pull on their heartstrings, uh, go up and uh, give your mom or dad a big hug, you know, just like, like make it seem completely uh, unplanned, unsolicited, just like, just like randomly give them a big hug. And don't let go, just, just sit there, just hug them for a minute, you know, like a long minute. And, uh, you know, it, it may be a really weird experience for them and they may or may not ask, are you okay? Um, but don't answer the question. Just, just say yes. And then come back the next day and, uh, you know, say, I could really use another hug. <laughs> Give them another hug, a long hug. And then, um, when you're done hugging, say, uh, you know, there's something that I really want and I think I know what your initial or quick response is going to be. You're going to say no, but this is really important to me. And it's really important to me because, and everybody's gonna have a different reason for why they want a roach. Come up with a really good reason, a compelling reason. And uh, often in getting what you want in life, it's, it's 
a couple different things. First, you have to have the leverage to be able to ask fairly. You know, the, that's the clean room. You know, do some nice things for them before you ask so that you have this leverage of doing something for what's really yourself, cleaning your room, but for them because they ask you 10 times a day to do these things. Um, and then, you know, like, like the hug, that's, that's the emotional bond. It's very manipulative, very good. Uh, so tr try all that and, uh, you know, if, if that doesn't work, come back to me and ask again, and uh, we'll dig in a little deeper on that. Um, and, and always keep in mind, by the way, that uh, childhood is, is very brief. It's over before you know it, and then you're in control of things for the rest of your life. And then one more thing, actually, compromise. There's often some room for negotiation in some things where if they say no to your preliminary um, versions of the approach or the question, uh, try to negotiate with them, you know, say, well, if I do such and such, can I have the roach, you know, chores around the house often works. Um, you know, if, if you get good grades at school on this next coming report card, something like that, try negotiating. Um, sometimes just by virtue of asking a thousand times, parents just eventually break down. It's really easy to say no at first, like I said, but later on, they just get so tired of hearing the same question over and over again. And, um, you know, they see that you have this sad cage in your room that you've got all set up for it and it's empty and you're just sitting in front of it for you know 30 minutes per day just staring you know just just longingly at this cage you know there's all kinds of little things you can do that's just the fun answer to the question i gotta have fun uh what is my favorite beetle species and so for these favorite questions i always like to answer them as follows my favorite beetle species is the next beetle I see that I've never seen before. You can hear that little ground squirrel up there. Sounds like a squeaky toy. Jessica mentioned that to me a while back and ever since she described it that way, that's all I hear now is squeaky toy. If you could gift someone with your biggest piece of knowledge, what would it be? Um, these are tough questions. Uh, my biggest piece of knowledge. Uh, you know, like knowledge, knowledge is often an obstacle to what's really important. And that is being happy. A lot of people get wrapped up in their minds. They just keep processing and recycling the same thoughts over and over again. Maybe you're one of those people that uh, your, your head hits the pillow at night and you don't fall asleep for an hour because you're constantly thinking, 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 and you sh can't shut your mind off. Um, because there's so many memories and there's so much knowledge that you have. Uh, knowledge can often, like I said, be, be an obstacle to just being happy. So uh, something that you could try uh, that's sort of related to what we were talking about a little bit ago here, just go outside. Just go outside and sit down. Uh, put your phone away just for 10 minutes. Leave your phone inside. Just sit outside and just look around, just see what's happening. Sit in the sun if you can, because um, you, you can feel the warmth of it on your skin. Think about your five senses, uh, you know, be, be aware of the thoughts that are creeping into your mind and you're thinking about this and that. And, you know, just like, just kind of let that stuff purge itself for a few minutes, but then just purposely stop every time, a, every time um, a, a thought comes into your head, just stop it and just try to look around at the bugs all around you and pay attention. Just observe what's happening around you. You know, forget this human world that we live in and just observe. Just, just try that a little bit. Uh, practice it. Practice turning your brain off and uh, not thinking about all of these same tired thoughts over and over again that we all do. And just see what kind of difference that makes for you. You'll probably sleep better too. What if it's a bug emergency? Can I call you? And so they're, they're playing off my, um, if this is a, an emergency, please hang up and dial 911 that I wrote in the ask me a question thing. Um, if you have my number, you can call me. That's my rule. Uh, only six people on the planet have my phone number and I like it that way. 
silence <laughs> is golden. And a phone that never rings is priceless, as I say on my website. Okay, serious question here. Zoology or wildlife biology? Which do you prefer and why? Um, zoology and wildlife biology. I think the difference is um, zoology being animals and then uh, wildlife biology, um, animals as they sort of relate to uh, ecosystems. And uh, many of you will be surprised probably to hear that entomology is not my favorite ology. It's not my favorite science. It's not my favorite study of something. I actually like ecology the best. I'm really into plants. I'm really into the interactions between insects and plants and everything that's sort of connected in an ecosystem. That's the level at which I'm really most interested in the world around me, believe it or not, to specialize just on insects. You know, if think about it this way, if, if I was sitting outside right now and um, everything but the insects disappeared around me, it would be fascinating for a few minutes because then I could see all the bugs, but uh, would a what a less stimulating place that would be uh, without all of these plants. I mean, you, you can see behind me right now, all you can really see is the plants. You may be seeing some birds and some bugs flying around me or something back there that I cannot even see. But take the plants out and, uh, you know, it's not very interesting. You take the, uh, you, you, you leave just the animals out there and all we're gonna see behind us is birds um, and insects, I guess, because insects are animals, but uh, I, would, I would say wildlife biology for that reason. What's the most colorful American species of beetle? Um, you know, there's thousands of colorful species. To, to, like, to say which one is the most colorful is kind of a subjective thing anyway. Uh, it, one person might say this one's the most colorful, another might say this is the most colorful. Um, I'm going to say rainbow dung beetle for lack of an amazing answer to that question. What is my favorite true spider to keep? Um, again, because I run a business, the only ones that I tend to keep uh, are the ones that are available on the website. Uh, my customers sort of universally love the regal jumping spiders because they're a large, um, showy, active spider species. They they don't mess around when it's time to hunt their prey. You drop a fly or a cricket or a roach inside their cage and they are using strategy and their amazing sense of vision to um, plan their approach to how they're going to attack, eat this prey item in the cage. Fun to watch. Another one that I really like is the black hole spider, Kukulcania. Um, they're very large, the leg span reaching about two inches, and uh, they've got sort of a velvety black appearance, and they're very gentle spiders. They're capable of moving quickly, but if you're handling one, they tend to be more handleable than a jumping spider, for example, and I think they're a little bit underappreciated. Um, in the hobby. What insect species has been the hardest for you to keep and work with? Um, I'd say the pretty easy answer to that question is the uh, devil flower, the devil's flower, uh, Idolomantis diabolica, uh, a, a pain in the butt mantis species. Need a lot of heat, they don't want to molt properly off of every other kind of surface that every other mantis most easily does. What are all the things you use for your centipedes? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, it's a really broad question. Uh, you got a tank, you got some kind of substrate, it's best uh, according to centipede hobbyists, if you have more of an inorganic substrates like pebbles, rocks, uh, sand maybe, things like that, because organic substrates may harbor bacteria or mold, and this could contribute to foot rot in the centipedes. It's good to have a little water dish in there, something for them to hide under, ideally. Um, I've kept centipedes in a million different ways. 
Uh, I don't tend to see foot rot issues. I don't know if that has more to do with specimens that may become in compromised or ill in some way in terms of imports from other countries, but I, I never deal in the imported specimens either. So really pretty basic. Tank, some kind of substrate, something for them to hide under, a very shallow water dish. And then if you throw the prey in there and they don't eat it, pull it out because they might eat a multi centipede. If they do eat it, but they don't eat it completely, pull the prey out so it doesn't attract mites and things like that into the cage. Uneaten food will mold a little bit. So uh, just keep things clean and uh, you know check, check on it once every week or two. Where do I live? Uh, Portland, Oregon. I was born here, went to school here, and uh, I will probably live here for as long as I run my business because it's a mild place, easy to ship out of uh, 365 days a year, never too hot, never too cold. There are some exceptions for a few days every year, but more often it has to do with uh, my weather being hot here. You know, if, if, if we reach 95 degrees and the place I'm shipping to is also 95 degrees, I sometimes have to work with the customer to uh, reschedule the shipment. And most customers are generally just fine with that. I love the Portland area. You can see how green it is. Um, it's a wonderful city for so many reasons. It's been in the news a lot lately. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that. Um, a lot of that stuff actually happens about 10 minutes from where I live, but um, you know, it only happens there and the media really blows it out of proportion. Um, it's a, a wonderful, beautiful city. We, I can go, you know, an hour and a half that direction and I'm at the Pacific Ocean. I can go an hour and a half that direction and I'm on a snow covered mountain. I can go uh, an hour and a half in a different direction and we're in the Oregon high desert. Forests everywhere. Um, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful place to live. What's my favorite invertebrate? <laughs> the next invertebrate I see that I've never seen before. Best bug spot in Tucson. It's my home. Um, Mount Lemon is right there. Uh, you know, I, I don't spend Tucson even being a southern city in the state of Arizona or relatively southern, it's still at the northern edge of where I like to hang out when I'm in Arizona because most of the uh, sky islands are uh, the, de the mountains in the desert there in this warm state. They are south and east of Tucson. And so Mount Lemmon is a cool place to go up. You'll see a lot of good stuff up there if you just drive up, you know, the main road and uh, take your time, get out every once in a while. Um, there's a lot of pull-offs that they've built parking lots. Just get out at those. Anywhere where you can find water up there on Mount Lemmon is definitely worth checking out. Um, how many bugs does it take to change a light bulb? And are moths considered bugs? Um, it takes uh, two and a half uh, bugs to change a light bulb. That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. And are moths considered bugs? I consider moths bugs. There is a lot of people who, uh, the, the word bug is always under debate. Uh, people really like to argue about it. I don't like to argue about it. I don't like to really argue about anything. Arguing can be fun and it can be sport, but you know, I don't argue about religion because I'm, I'm you know, in my mid forties and like been there, done that. Like there's, there's nothing else to talk about. There's no answers to the question. Um, and, and words, are just meant for people to communicate with each other. Um, and the point being that we understand what the other person is talking about. Um, you know, if people want to argue about whether bug should only be applied to the um, order Hemiptera, which includes the true bugs like stink bugs and box elder bugs and assassin bugs, you know, they, if, if they're so passionate about that being the definition of the word bug, then, you know, they can, they can have that. I'm happy uh, uh, disagreeing with them and I'm not even attached to my, my state of experiencing disagreement with them. I don't care. I really don't care. For me, the word bug is synonymous with the word arthropod. 
and um, you can look in an entomology textbook. You can look at, you know, dictionary.com because nobody actually has a paper dictionary anymore. Um, you can talk to a, a hundred different people and get a hundred different. Uh, some people will include uh, crabs as bugs because they are arthropods. Some people will say, well, um, because it's marine, that doesn't count as a bug. But if it's a freshwater bug on land, then that can count as a bug. Um, so for me, it just means means arthropod. And so, yes, moths are bugs. Uh, my website is called Bugs in Cyberspace. Uh, it's been called that for a very long time. And uh, I don't consider myself a, an authority on the definition of the word bug, but uh, I know how I use it. And... Uh, I am just fine with you using it any way you want to. Someone asks, how are my velvet worms? I'm going to be getting more velvet worms in here in a couple weeks, and they will be available. I'll just leave it at that for now. Opinion on eating bugs. Should we normalize eating them as a protein like in other parts of the world? Uh, my opinion on eating bugs is that uh, if there is some culture in the world that eats them and they know how to prepare them both in a tasty and safe way, then there's no reason why I wouldn't try it. And from experience, I can tell you that if something, something is being prepared by somebody and uh, they prepare it frequently, and the people that they are serving it to like it, I'm going to like it too because I'm not a picky eater. Uh, moreover, I'm a very adventurous eater, and if I have an opportunity to try something that is both safe and supposedly tasty, or even not so tasty, sometimes people will say that, you know, people in this culture love this food, but when uh, Americans try it, they're really disgusted by it. They can't stand it. Well, that to me is a draw. I want to try that. I want to have that experience. And in the case of uni, the sea urchin roe um, in sushi, it took me trying it quite a few times to like it. I've been trying my whole life with tomatoes. I've actually eaten two, two small tomatoes today. I don't like tomatoes. I do like to eat them, however, for the health benefits and for the moisture that they add to some foods. But to eat one alone by itself, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm not done trying. And as far as uh, should we normalize eating them as a protein like in other parts of the world, should we normalize them? Um, you know, the food that you put in your mouth is a personal decision, just like everything else in life. So many people want to get up in other, each other's business about, you know, what they should and shouldn't do. That's, that's not why I'm here. That's, that's not the, uh, the approach I take to other human beings around me. I don't spend a lot of time with other human beings, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and so the time that I do spend with them, I find them very interesting. I like people. I really, really like people a lot. Um, but uh, it's, it's not for me to judge or be judged. There's a lot of judgment that comes here in social media. People are constantly judging me, um, but I, I, I don't care. Uh, next question. If you could be adopted and raised by any bug, which would it be? These kinds of questions are the hardest for me to answer because uh, I, I don't I don't have that part of my brain that is either really inspired by a question like this. No offense, um, and or, or I don't I don't I don't feel like a, a creed. It doesn't stimulate any sense of creativity in me to imagine being raised by other bugs. Um, you know I I suppose uh, I suppose I would want to be an ant, um, just because ants are so successful, there's more of them than, than anything else in terms of um, numbers on the planet. And, uh, you know, it's a success, it's working for them. So I guess that's my answer. Uh, who is craziest, ornithologists, botanists, or entomologists? Um, who is craziest? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that I could approach answering this question. 
uh, I will just speak from all I really can speak from anyway, which is, is my own experience in interacting with those groups of organisms. Um, I find plants very interesting. I can, I can get up right, right up next to them and, um, I can, I can observe them. They're not going to, uh, fly away from me or crawl away from me. Insects, sort of the same. I, there are so many of them out there. There's so much diversity. There are so many coming and going that I can easily be amused or curious um, or gratified by the amount of them around here. I can look around and find bugs right now if I try. Now birds, I, I think that you have to be a very patient person. I don't know if crazy I would go that far, but uh, they're fleeting. They, they come and they land and they're, they're, always, they're never near you. They're out of reach. They're almost out of eyesight. And if you blink, they're gone. And you may never see that bird again or that species of bird again. And so, um, but then the reverse side of the coin there is that when you do, and I have a friend who keeps a bird list of every bird species that he ever encounters. And uh, even for the year, he, he is marking down all of the bird species that he sees each year. And that can be gratifying, of course, in its own way, because the more difficult, the more elusive uh, your quarry is, uh, the more challenging the game is, the more satisfied you are at the end um, if you make some observations. So, you know, it can sort of go both ways. Um, what is the most observed? thing you've used as a container to collect something. Uh, my pockets. I can't tell you how many times I have been out somewhere and not having a container. I have, and I tend to wear these, these sort of cargo shorts here, but you know, sometimes I just have these kind of pockets. I'll put bugs in my pockets. Uh, there are certain things I won't put in my pockets, like um, spiders, something that might bite me because it's pressed or pinched. Um, I have put spiders in my pockets though, just very carefully, like in the, the cargo ones that are kind of baggy. I can't tell you how many times I have later in the day thought to myself, oh, <laughs> forgot. And so I'll, I'll carefully open my pocket up and, you know, mixed results on what's going on in the pocket without going into too much detail. Uh, many times also, I have found vials, because I, I do often carry vials in my pockets. And uh, I'll find, I'll, I'll put my hand in my pocket and I'll, I'll pull the container or the lid out. They are no longer attached to one another. And so whatever was in there, well, sometimes a spider has escaped into my pocket. So that happens. What are some obscure insect species more people should keep? bonus points for roaches. Okay, let's just focus on roaches. Um, well, I don't know about obscure. You're, what you're talking about, I think, are ones that are not common in the hobby. And of course, by virtue of them uh, being more regularly kept, they would then become more common in the hobby and then more people would have them. So rhino roaches, are a really good example of something that is obscure. They're widely known. They're uh, very, very regularly sought after, requested. Um, and so if more people have them, more people then can then in turn breed them and have them. Um, one species that I would love to get again are the pill bug roaches. Those, I don't know if they're in the US currently. I think they are, but I don't really run in the uh, roach circles as much as I used to, just on account of being very busy. What is the best way to willingly introduce, introduce somebody who is unsure of or frightened of bugs? Um, this gets back into that territory that I don't really tread into very often. Um, I just do me. I just, I just do what I do. And um, if the people around me are, you know, judging me and um, 
you know, they're, they're having some kind of problem with it or they're going out of their way to, um, you know, say negative things about what I'm doing. You know, I just, I, I don't have any time in my life for that. In, in fact, I, I only hang out with people who like bugs um, because I can. <laughs> it's uh, one of the benefits of having a large social media presence and a long time business is that I meet lots of awesome people who are interested in the exact same things I'm interested in. And so I don't have the time or energy for all of those other kinds of people. I don't have to. And so I don't. Um, and so if you are on some crusade personally to change, you know, I, 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 they're not going to change me, nor, nor do I try to change them in any way. Um, the older you get, the less time and energy you spend trying to change. Not everybody. It's not necessarily just because you get older, you don't do this as much. But um, you will be happier if you're not trying to change the people around you to be more like you, for example. Some will come willingly. Uh, some, some never will. Uh, I have had many family members. We don't get to choose our family members, right? Who, despite me trying all of their lives or all of my life to get them more interested in what I'm interested in, um, it just doesn't happen. And that's okay because they're family. Um, now, if it was another person in, in my social sphere um, and, you know, I, I might try to, you know, I mean, because bugs are a big part of my life, so I'll be talking about bugs, you know, here and there. Uh, but the truth is, is that because I spend so much time talking about bugs all the time, when I'm hanging out with other people who aren't interested in bugs, it's actually kind of a nice break for me to talk about other things. And uh, I, I really enjoy that in the same way I'm enjoying working on these podcasts, interviewing other kinds of animals, uh, people who study them with my friend Jesse. Um, it's, it's interesting to talk about those other things. Uh, so what you can do just to give you a little bit of practical advice for, um, for the people around you, uh, you know, just, just let them see and experience these bugs through your eyes and through your passion. Um, I have known, uh, many bug keepers to have a spouse, um, you know, and these are generally a keeper, uh, you know, he, for example, himself is new to bugs and uh, he starts having an interest in it and it grows a little bit. He buys a few pet bugs and then he finds out that his spouse who, you know, was never involved in the pet bug hobby at all has a curiosity about them too. And so then they both become interested in them. And, you know, he has a pet scorpion and he's feeding it crickets. And uh, she's always been interested in mantises um, or, you know, they, they were watching a documentary or something and uh, they're both nature people. And so now they both have a pet that eats crickets. Uh, so it can, it can go like that. Um, so just, just, you know, just do your thing and let them, let them see what you're doing. If they seem to have a curiosity about it, give them a little bit more to teach them a thing or two about your pets and, um, you know, maybe show them uh, my Instagram account or my YouTube account and, uh, let them see some of the other options that are out there in the pet bug world, for example. Um, but you can't force somebody to be interested in anything. And uh, more often than not, if you do try to force them into being interested in something, it's going to have the opposite effect. Uh, parents notice this in raising their children very frequently that uh, everybody, even children, are very uh, sensitive to uh, tone and uh, certain words that we ourselves as uh, the influencer <laughs> don't even really realize that we're doing. Um, a lot of things happening on sort of a subconscious level. And so if you're, if you're trying to slowly, what's that? I don't know, it's a, it's like a hawk. 
Um, I've got a lot of owls in the area too, but that wasn't an owl. I really want to go look, but we're busy here. Um, I was saying that, you know, the, the more you try to push somebody in a direction, um, the more resistant they are going to be. And, and all of these things happen on these subtle levels. So, you know, before you know it, you may have inadvertently done the opposite and backed them into a corner where they will be more resistant um, and against even curiosity that they otherwise uh, might have had about the topic if they start to feel a little coerced. What was the first insect that made you decide that you had a passion for insects? Um, it's, I, I, my parents tell me stories uh, about when I was a child. I've always been interested in them. I cannot remember the first because my own memory doesn't go back that far. And that's, I, from the first time that I could go outside, it, it's just, it's always been bugs. I mean, it's always been nature, but bugs are the most accessible. They're, they're the things moving in the yard. They're coming and going. And so for me, they're the most interesting part of nature. What is the hardest to care for insect you've ever had? I've failed miserably with a bunch of different things over the years. Um, and many of those things can be something so simple as something that I find in the yard here that I'm curious about. And so, um, for example, I might take a snake fly larva in. We have someone on here uh, who comments on YouTube frequently about how they had an adult female snake fly it laid eggs, they hatched the larvae, they're caring for the larvae. So it's a fascinating topic for me. Um, and so I've, I've failed to bring in lots of things from the outdoors. Uh, and so th there's been a lot of hardest things for me over the years. Um, I fail regularly with uh, the devil's flowers a mantis species. I don't say devil's flower mantises because they're not flower mantises. A lot of people put those three words together. I try really hard not to. Um, what else have I failed with? Uh, well, we were talking about the pill bug roaches. Uh, I, I never managed to, I had a small colony of them. I'm not sure if I ever got them up to adults, but I failed to reproduce those through a single generation. So that's something that I would like to try again. What was your first ever tarantula and what made you go get your first? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's possible the first tarantulas I ever had was for a business that I ran with a friend. I was an insect guy. He was more of an arachnid guy. We started a business many years ago called Mysterious Creatures, and it preceded my bugs and cyberspace business, although my website was older than that business. Um, and, you know, I remember just for example, we were one of the first people to bring the uh, Pteranochylus marunus, the, they call them OBTs, orange bitey things orange baboon tarantulas. We were one of the first people to bring those in the hobby, and that was before anybody knew how venomous they were. Um, we had them as slings, uh, like three quarter inch slings, spiderlings for those of you who are not tarantula keepers and don't, don't know what a sling is. Um, it was also really neat to see, you know, a uh, hundred Goliath bird eater babies back then. Uh, and you know we had lots of we had lots of adult tarantulas too. Um, yeah, just I, I don't remember. <laughs> it's been a long time. Do you ever wonder what goes through a spider's mind when it gets thrown out of a car? <laughs> uh, I'm not. I mean, I know the person's just joking and everything, but there are a lot of people. Is that one of those orange flies again? Oh yeah, maybe I can show you this one. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's flying rather slowly right in this area here. See that orange fly over there? Um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the joke, uh, what's the last thing that goes through a fly's mind when it hits the windshield? And the answer is, it's butt. <laughs> uh, we'll just leave it at that. Spy spiders, spiders don't uh, 
think like people do, of course. Uh, four more questions, and there will be some more questions, I think, but here we are. Should glow spot roaches only be kept in groups? I will follow up in a direct message. Um, you can keep a single roach by itself. I've never heard a roach complain. Uh, it is, of course, better to keep them in colonies because uh, roaches are, to some extent, social insects, and their biological purpose is to reproduce, and uh, unless you have a, an already fertilized female, you are uh, not going to have a colony of them. And if you do have a fertilized female, you'll subsequently have a colony of them, of course. When will you have orchid babies for sale? And they're referring to orchid mantises. And I have no idea when I'll have orchid mantises again. If I have an opportunity to acquire them, I assure you I will be acquiring them as quickly as possible. How many isopods do you have per enclosure? Um, these kinds of questions are always tricky because in the asker's mind, they have something very definitive. They may be picturing like a shoebox container with uh, a particular isopod species in it with a particular substrate depth. Um, I can't answer a question like this without knowing if we're talking about how many isopods we can keep on a, in a tank the size of this planet, or if you're talking about, you know, an eight ounce deli cup or a shoebox bin, really depends. It depends also on the isopod species. You can have uh, hundreds of dwarf isopods in a shoebox size container, but you might only want to keep maybe 30 Porcelio expansus Beetlejuice isopods in a container that size. Um, what other animals will there be videos on? Um, I'm going to be making a YouTube video at least once per week, every week, and it will be on at least one animal. My last video was on two different beetle species for YouTube, the fuzzy darkling beetles and the, what did I call them, micro goblin tenebs. <laughs> it's fun to make names up for things, by the way. Uh, I don't know what my next animal video is going to be about. Uh, I did make an awesome video for Instagram today. I try to do almost daily posts to Instagram. If some of you YouTubers are not on Instagram, download the app, follow me on Instagram. If you like my YouTube channel, you're going to love my Instagram channel. Uh, to the music of putting on the Ritz today, I had a short 23 second video of blue death feigning beetles. If you're blue, boom, 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 putting on the Ritz. I had blue death feigning beetles on Ritz crackers. Uh, I mean, if that doesn't make you want to download Instagram right now, just just to see that video, then then forget I even asked you to do it because Instagram is awesome and so is TikTok. I actually made that video on TikTok and reposted it on Instagram. Uh, both of those social media platforms are so much fun. Um, YouTube is my favorite uh, for many reasons. I do prefer the longer format. Um, and speaking of long, we are at a breaking point here now because I've answered all of the questions that had been asked up to this point in me making the video. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.